This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Thank you very much, Barry, and um, thank you uh, for coming to this third lecture, particularly after the catastrophe of the last one. Um, I have risked some more movies, but we'll see how they go. Um, and to Dr. Chandaria, thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, it is an extravagant uh, title, but it's meant to be a kind of rhetorical question rather than a statement. Uh, we um, are going through a phase of enormous optimism on the side of, of science, on the side of neuroscience, about its potential to explain things that were either thought to be beyond the possibility of analysis by science, or maybe even um, literally not appropriate for science to address. Issues like um, consciousness, um, I intentionality, um, agency, self, and all of those um, grand issues that, that philosophers like to think about. There's no doubt that neuroscience is beating at the door of many of those, um, those areas. And what I want to do in this lecture is to review um, critically some of the methodologies that are used for the sorts of inferences that we've heard, all heard about, explaining brain functions, and then um, um, to try to readdress what the real challenge is of um, neural explanations of understanding are. And let me put my position um, squarely on the table to begin with. Um, I'm a reductionist and a materialist. Um, I think that the brain does it all. Um, perhaps in ways that are presently completely mysterious, but it does it all. And therefore, um, it, it is appropriate to ask scientific questions, or empirical questions, about how it's done. I mean, it might be that there are questions of brain function, as there might well be uh, other areas of natural function in the world that are simply beyond either the methodologies of science or the ability of human beings to un understand what's going on, to understand the data that's delivered by science, to understand how to design appropriate experiments. And there are certainly some big issues which I'll talk about briefly in, in that respect. But the starting position for any scientist who, any scientist who um, studies the brain and is interested in, in behavior must be that nothing's out of bounds. Uh, that the, the, the starting hypothesis is that everything can be explained until we come up to a, uh, a brick wall that's, that uh, either says you haven't got the methodologies to get any further or there are things here that in principle are not explicable. There are strange phenomena which simply can't be addressed by your techniques. We just have to battle on a daily basis. If you sort of st stopped in advance and, uh, uh, and decided that there was territory you couldn't go into because you were likely not to be able to explain it or it wasn't appropriate, then you know, how would you draw those, those boundaries? How would you um, know um, the, about the validity of, of what you are currently doing? So the starting point has to be that it, it, it should, in principle, be possible to give an account of everything that we are as thinking, deciding, living, choosing, conscious beings in terms of um, our brain. Now, th that might sound a very kind of um, new hypothesis, and lots of people, including Francis Crick, have made a living out of saying that it is new. Um, he wrote a book called The Astonishing Hypothesis, what, 15 years ago now, declaring that, you know, the brain's got to be responsible for all these high-level things, including consciousness, and goodness, isn't that astonishing as a hypothesis? Well, it wouldn't have been astonishing to Hippocrates, who said pretty much the, the same thing, nor indeed to um, uh, Galen, who... Um, founded, in a sense, uh, um, the, the study of biology uh, through his work um, dissecting um, bodies and brains. Um, and it was, um, I think I might have mentioned this before, it was out of Galen's work that this curious um, hypothesis that, that, uh, that called the cell doctrine came to dominate for, for 1,500 years, almost 1,500 years, to dominate Western thought about brain function. And just to remind you briefly, the idea was, and Galen had observed the chambers inside the, uh, the brain filled with clear fluid, um, and great significance was attached to the discovery of a new fluid inside the body, given the um, domination still of Aristotelian ideas about um, body, bodily fluids and their, their balances. This new fluid was thought to be responsible essentially for mental functions. 
um, mental and physical functions of the brain. So the idea was that there, was, there were three cells loosely uh, correlated with the ventricular system of the brain, inside the brain, filled with this fluid that circulated through it, receiving information from the sense organs into the first of the cells, the fluid transmitted back into the middle cell where uh, cogitation, estimation and rationality were supposed to happen, and then finally back into the last cell that was responsible in this picture for memory, but also in other similar diagrams for, for movement. And the point was about these descriptions that nothing was left out. There was no sense that there was something that was beyond bounds. This incredibly simplistic, naive, and inaccurate model of how the brain works was assumed to be capable of accounting for everything. Um, rationality, reasoning, uh, estimation, cogitation, all, all of these things, as well as our perception of the world um, and our memories um, and our ability to act and organize our movements. Um, the qualification to this um, hypothesis uh, came, and I think I might have mentioned this before as well, through observations of, uh, of, of Leonardo's um, at, the, at the, um, the end of the 15th century. Initially, and these are his first diagrams when he began his great anatomical project, um, dissecting human bodies as well as animal bodies, basically to improve the quality of his painting. Um, he started to dissect brains at quite a, long, a late stage in his, in his work, and this was one of his early speculative diagrams before he had actually started to try to dissect um, brains, and you can see that he represents, although in a rather fuzzy, hazy, uncertain way, the three chambers in the classical form inside the head, the first one connected to the eyes, because the first one was supposed to receive the information from the senses. And here again, a speculative cross-section of the head, a horizontal section, again throwing, showing these three imagined chambers, they're nothing like that in reality. Um, he began to dissect, and uh, uh, again, I think I might have uh, mentioned that he was uh, aided by the brilliant application of um, casting techniques, injecting hot wax into the ventricles of the brain of an ox, of a dead ox, before peeling off the tissue to reveal a, the, the structure, rather like casting a, a statue in bronze. And this enabled him to see the true structure of the ventricles in more um, detail, more ac accurate than anyone had ever shown before. And this is from uh, his diagram of the, uh, not of the human brain, of the ox uh, brain, um, around 1506 in which he shows in great detail the true structure of the ventricles. This is the brain upside down. Um, that's the brain viewed from below. And here's a cross-section through the brain showing a complex arrangement of chambers inside the brain. And he, um, as others had do, he, done and did in the future, identified the pair of what are called lateral ventricles that run through the hemispheres with the first cell of the classical structure, the middle ventricle, which we call the third ventricle, in the middle of the brain here, as the second cell, um, and then the fourth ventricle down in the brainstem as the third cell. But what he noticed was that as he did the dissection was that the major nerves, particularly the optic nerves, um, didn't pass towards the first cell, the lateral um, ventricles, the sides of the head. They passed towards the middle of the brain, much closer to the, the third ventricle, the middle cell, the second cell. So he very courageously, but with, you know, with the, um, the eye of, uh, of the faith of observation, relabeled the figures and put um, uh, sensus communis, the common sense, on this middle chamber rather than on the, on the, um, the first um, pair of, uh, uh, of ventricles. So that was the beginning of the application of observation as well as just hypothesis and speculation as to how the brain might produce its functions, including mental functions. And there was really uh, no doubt until um, the time of Descartes that there might be anything else to explain that couldn't be explained in, in, physical, in physical terms. So uh, Crick, far, far from the hypothesis being astonishing, Crick's hypothesis was um, a very ancient one just being reformulated. Let me ri remind you of what Crick um, actually said, because his ideas were mainly concerned with consciousness. Um, and he said uh, that... Uh, the, our subjectivity, our, our, um, our knowledge in this apparently pictorial form of, of things around us, and he thought mainly in terms of visual perception, sensory co consciousness, um, uh, phenomenal um, consciousness, as Ned Block 
would, would call it, rather than um, access consciousness, the consciousness of your own, your own thoughts and your intentions. But he was much more concerned with, um, with, uh, with phenomenal consciousness, with sensory and perceptual consciousness. He said that um, th this is a really interesting phenomenon, that this happens. We all know that we have it. It appears to be playing a, a powerful, important part in our lives. It's a big phenomenon, um, completely unexplained. Um, it's time that neuroscientists actually started to address that question. And he did see that the, the nature of perceptual exper experiences, whether your red is the same as my red, those kind of classic um, um, pub quiz sorts of philosophy questions, um, uh, was unlikely to be addressable in simple terms, maybe never addressable. But questions like, you know, how, is conscious, how are conscious states generated by the brain? What state, what condition does the brain have to be in to make them? Um, why are we not always conscious of the things that we can be conscious of? What might the role of attention be in tuning the brain to, to, to exude its consciousness? These were all legitimate questions. So he talks in terms of the neural um, basis, if you like, the neural correlate, as he called it, of consciousness. He, he thought that, it would, that the first step in this enterprise should be to look for signatures of activity in the brain that correlated tightly with the, the onset or the presence of conscious experience um, and inversely correlated with, were, were, I mean, also turned off when, when consciousness turned off very reliably. It was a, a, a highly correlated variation between this brain state and conscious state which, correlate, which correlates very well. Um, he imagined that the evidence would come from a number of um, sources, um, partly from the study of individual nerve cells, recording exper painstaking experiments in which activity is picked up with microelectrodes from individual cells. But he saw that that was, you know, that was, it was going to be very difficult to approach the whole problem on a kind of cell-by-cell -cell basis, because there's just such a lot of them, and they're so diverse and varied in their properties. And what he hoped then was that there might be mass activities of patches of brain that could be picked up in a variety of ways, with brain waves or with brain scanning, that might provide a clue as to the, the state of the brain when consciousness was, was generated. So um, magnetic resonance imaging was certainly one of the tools that he imagined would be very important. And I've mentioned this in previous lectures. Let me just refresh your memory about what it can and cannot do. Um, MRI scanning simply measures, at least the way it's deployed here, simply measures um, the presence of water in the brain and the orientation of water molecules. So if you look at um, changes in the water signature in brain scans, it can give you an indication of blood flow, and changes of blood flow. Um, also, if you look at the orientation, the progressive orientation of water molecules, it can give you a, a, a sense of the, uh, the, the direction in which bundles of nerve fibers are traveling through the brain. It's a technique called diffusion tensor imaging, which is, which is becoming more and more refined and sophisticated and yielding a lot of interesting information quite recently. Um, but the, but the, the method that's been most widely employed so far is um, fMRI, um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which has um, become so well now, known that it's, it's, it's sort of entered the, the popular consciousness. Um, I don't know whether I showed this wonderful picture before, but it's from a, uh, an advertisement for um, a Sony projector. Um, produced a few years ago, which shows um, brain activity, you know, in, in the familiar form that we all know with these structural pictures of brains with blobs on them, um, in, a, in a, a series of cognitive tasks, filling out a tax return, um, driving a car, reading this line, or using a Sony projector. So the, the, the message is very clear, you know, Sony's projector is so well designed, you don't use much of your brain. Uh, I mean, these are completely fictitious, of course, and then, you know, I can feel the wincing around the room from the two or three neuroscientists who are, who are here. With some of, most of the activity is localised over this structure called the corpus callosum, which is a bundle of fibres that wouldn't show activity um, at all in, this guy, in any kind of experiment. But I just illustrate this to show the way in which the, the reading of these, these pictures 
has really become part of everyday experience. We're all familiar with the idea that it's possible to look at the brain, to interpret blobs on it as meaning the localization of, uh, of function in it. And let me just again repeat briefly a description of, um, of the kind of experiment that's done to reveal apparently committed um, uh, areas within the cerebral cortex um, that seem to be concerned with analyzing one, uh, one aspect or another or of a stimulus or one component or another of a, of a plan of action or a decision that's being made. In this case, um, the experiment was designed to look at the visual areas of the brain. I, I discussed it briefly before. What Tim Andrews did in this experiment was to show people, while they were lying in the scanner, real photographs of human faces, just briefly, 10 seconds each picture, um, interleaved randomly in sequence, with, um, with photographs of man-made objects. So these things, these snapshots just came up, in random face, face, object, face, object, and so on. Um, and then the uh, computer miraculously arranged the data show, so as to show regions of the brain that were more strongly um, activated, as the expression goes, I mean, literally, where blood flow increased relatively more for the faces, that's the orange blob, compared with the objects, that's the, the blue blob. Um, the face area is called the face area very wide, wide, uh, widely, the fusiform face area. It's on the right side of the brain. It's under, underneath the temporal lobes of the brain. If, as part of the root of visual areas progressing down into the lower part of the temporal cortex, which is gen generally thought to be involved, in the analysis and the understanding of, of <coughs> objects, of things that are out in space. So this very distinctive area on the right-hand side has been identified by many studies like this, in fact, from a number of different parallel observations. Um, and the, the, the evidence is pretty strong that that region is concerned with our perception of, uh, of faces. In this particular case, there's a nearby area just a little bit further ahead um, in the right temporal cortex called the parahippocampal gyrus, which happened to, in this experiment with the clever computer jiggery-pokery that was done um, to be slightly more um, perfused with blood when the person was looking at the objects than when they were looking at the faces. So you could say, okay, that's an, that's an object-sensitive area in the same way that there's a lot of evidence that the orange spot is, is a face-sensitive area. Well, I'll come back to whether one can draw that inference from this experiment um, in a moment. Let, let's imagine the sorts of things that might be possible if it turns out that you can read off from the pattern of MRI activity different patches of activity that correspond to the content of a person's perception, which in turn correlates in some way with, with what they're looking at. So here's an experiment by Haxby and his colleagues in which he showed various sorts of visual stimuli. There we are, faces, houses, bits of furniture, shoes or whatever. And in, in real time, therefore with lots of noise in the signal, looked at the activity in the brain. Normally, these brain scans are based on lots and lots of presentations of the same thing in lots and lots of different people, typically 20 or 30 and then they're cleverly all combined together, despite the fact that brains vary in size, to produce the single, nice, clear, sharp pictures that you typically see. In reality, this is the sort of, this is the best that you can do with, at the statistics, the, the limit of the statistics, if you show one image to a person and then just look at what's happened in their brain. So these, are, these show areas of increased activity, that's the red, and decreased blood flow in the blue. Um, for these different stimuli. They look sort of pretty similar to each other, but you can put them into a pattern recognition algorithm, a computer program that classifies these single images without averaging, just showing the stimulus again and again, but the individual um, classification is done on the basis of single presentations. So the, the, the um, pattern rec recognizer builds up a kind of view of the identity of the, uh, of the um, characteristic brain activities associated with different objects. So it learns in the same way that it might learn to recognize a fingerprint. So now you can challenge it by giving the person an observation of one thing, look at this one thing, 
show the um, computer, as it were, the output of their brain when they've looked at that one thing um, and ask the computer, what's it likely to be? And it'll make a, a guess by decoding it by comparison with the previous exposures, make its best guess and, and can apply a probability to its guess to tell you how sure that it is. So these things are certainly possible and they, and, and they of course, tell you nothing about the, how directly these apparent patches of increase and de decrease activity have to do with the subjective experience of the person. They are just an indirect way of, um, of decoding um, uh, physical changes in brain states that are simply correlated with what the person is, is looking at. Um, yet it's very easy and very tempting to talk of this kind of approach as mind reading, which is a, a, an expression that is increasingly used as, almost as a technical term rather than just a kind of pejorative uh, description of an experimental approach. People talk in terms of taking um, MRI images as a direct readout of the mind of the, of the individual. So that's a huge leap of logic and um, an inference and interpretation beyond <coughs> the reality. You can go a step further and say, well, you know, if we know what patterns of increases and decreases of activity occur when a person sees something, has an experience, looks at a scene, might it, might it be possible to, to go backwards and to encode through a stimulating device of some sort um, a, a pattern of increased and decreased activity which is imposed on the brain in the same pattern that would occur if they were looking at something. Um, and what's shown here is a um, hypothetical magnetic stimulating device that is somehow, and this is technically not possible at the moment, capable of imposing patches of increased and decreased um, um, activity in the brain, which, which then will um, produce changes in, in blood flow, and you can see those uh, hypothetically read off in the, in the image on, on the left. So the idea might be that if you can induce activity which leads to the same sort of blood flow that happens when the person is having a particular experience, they will have that experience again. Well, that is an enormous leap of, um, um, of faith because it makes direct assumptions about the relationship between brain activity and what they, what they are perceiving. And, and this, by the way, has not, not been done. In any, well, certainly in anything like this detail. You can stimulate bits of the brain and people will report, will report um, feeling things or seeing things. Uh, if you stimulate at the back here, they, uh, they say that they see, they see little tiny flashes of light in their visual field, rather like hitting, hitting them on the head, and they see, see stars. Or if you stimulate them over their motor cortex here, it might produce little jerking movements of the opposite side, of, somewhere on the opposite side of the body that they look at and, and, and uh, have no sense of ownership of and just say it happening to them because their brain's being being stimulated. That is a very long way, of, uh, long way away from being able to address subjective experiences and subjective decision making by imposing electrical activity on, on the brain. So how then might one probe consciousness? I want to spend a little time talking about a technique that I think has, been, has yielded at least another, a slightly higher level of, um, uh, of evidence. For, the, for, for neural correlates of conscious experience. Um, this is um, a painting by, by Dali, of course, and it's, it has two titles. Um, it's called um, uh, The Bust of Voltaire um, or The Slave Market. And the reason it has two titles is, of course, because it's, it's an ambiguous image. It's very, whatever you think of Dali, it's, it's very, you know, technically extremely clever, the way in which it's been painted. And I would guess that some of you, perhaps particularly those furthest away, are seeing this odd thing here as a bust. There's a face, here are the eyes, there's the nose, here's the chin, um, standing on this sort of pedestal arrangement. Yes? It's actually very similar to a bust of Voltaire, which is in the Louvre. It's, it is used as a model. But if you're a bit closer, and maybe even if you're not, and you just watch it for a while, you'll see it occasionally changing radically its organisation and you get the reason for the other title, because what you see is three small figures here, these two characters with white um, uh, collars, um, black uh, floppy hats, 
uh, tunics and white sort of apron and things here. And a, and a strange character here in a long kind of um, dark dressing gown. This is presumably the, the slave market. And if you watch it, once you know both of those interpretations, if you watch it for a while, it flips backwards and forwards from Voltaire to the slave market, Voltaire and the slave market every, every 15 seconds or so. Yes? Yes? Good. So it's ambiguous. Now, there's a number of things to, to note about this. One, um, you never see both. And that's really quite um, interesting and important and suggests that there's some significant process going on in your in your head that underpins it. Yes, there are two, two uh, 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 alternative interpretations. That's, that's fine. That's, that's understandable physically. Um, uh, so you, you might expect that some of the time your brain would see it one way, some another. But why a, a mechanism for making sure that there isn't, that the both, both interpretations aren't entertained at the same time? That implies that the brain is constantly searching to disambiguate what it sees. And in fact, um, the, the, any retinal image that you view um, is an infinite set of um, ambiguities. Uh, since the retinal image is a, is a two-dimensional projection, geometric projection, of what is usually a three-dimensional scene, um, there is no way of reverse engineering from the image with absolute certainty what the object was that produced it. If, for instance, you look at something and it forms a circular image on your retina, a perfect circle, you could indeed be looking at a hoop or something like that, exactly circular, facing you and orthogonally like this. Um, but equally, you could be looking at an, an oval ob object tilted away from you, whose image projected in such a way that it produced a perfect circle on your retina. So you have no way of disambiguating disamb reliably um, any retinal image in terms of its structure. We clearly tend to make assumptions, many of which must be based on our knowledge of the world and on, on our knowledge, for instance, that um, there are an awful lot of, re uh, of, uh, of right angles in man-made buildings, a lot of those assumptions are somehow projected onto our interpretation of the scene. So the brain is always, all the time, trying to look for the most plausible account of the information that it's receiving from the, from the sense organs. And this sort of trick image um, puts it into a position where it can't resolve that problem with a single most likely interpretation, and it flips between two, or sometimes even more than more than two. Okay, well, um, how, one, how, how then? Oh, the other important thing to say about this is that the image itself, of course, is not changing. So if you could detect changes in the brain associated with changes of perceptual interpretation, that tells you something about the brain, not just about the external world. The picture, the, the Dali that you're looking at is always the same. Your retinal image is always the same form. So these sudden changes of interpretation are happening in your mind and therefore presumably in your brain, which is making your, your mind. So that um, leads you to ask a question which can be quite, could be quite useful in interpreting the significance of this result. Uh, and that is to ask, what will these two areas of the brain do if the person looks at that pattern? Okay, this is the famous um, vase uh, face illusion, as it's, uh, uh, as, it, as it's called, and you're all familiar with it, I'm sure. If you just stare in the middle of it, you see it either as a white chalice, a vase, or a pair of profile, black profile faces. And again, it, it flips every few seconds, yes, between appearing like faces or vases. Well, um, I don't have to point out to you in relation to this that, you know, a vase is an object and faces are faces. We can ask, what happens to those to activity in those two areas, or blood flow in those two areas, when the person is looking at this pattern as it changes um, it, its interpretation from a vase to a face and vice versa? And that's exactly what Tim um, Andrews did in, in my lab a few years ago. He asked the people to press a button. Yes, it's just changed into a vase. Yes, it's just changed into a face. Um, and just asked the computer to focus on those patches um, and tell him how the activity in those areas changed immediately around the time of the button push. Now, there's a problem here because these responses are very slow. Changes in blood flow are slow, so unfortunately you can't use this to um, ask a very interesting question about whether the act how far ahead of the impression of the change the changes in the brain occur. But you can ask questions about the reliability 
of activity in those areas or blood flow in those areas in relation to what the person's seeing. Well, here's a nice result with just three subjects. This was an um, individual subject an analysis rather than pooling. Um, these three subjects looking at activity in the so-called face area, and it just these, these graphs plot the, the, the mean um, blood flow activity in the period immediately following a reported shift from a vase to a face. Yes, it's just changed to a face, right? This is the average blood flow that increase that occurs, as opposed to when the same person says it's just changed from a face to a vase, and it's less. And in every subject, there was a... Um, a highly statistically significant difference between the blood flow. This, this area just increased its activity more at the time that the person said that they had now seen the face rather than when they saw um, the vase. Um, well, uh, he, by looking at the... the um, by focusing the computer's attention on that area alone, Andrews could predict with something like 85% reliability what the person was conscious of, whether they were conscious of a vase <laughs> or, or a face. And I think that is a, at least a step further in the argument about the correlation of brain activity and con conscious states and interpretive um, states. And the interesting point of the experiment was that there was no reliable change of activity in the object area, in this, in this area which apparently responded more strongly when the person looked at real objects. So that area um, did not have a significant difference in blood flow activity when it had just changed to a vase or compared with when it had just changed to a face. And I think that argues quite strongly that this area is not in the mainstream of neural processing that's associated with those, those changes of perception, with the perception of, um, of objects. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence, other evidence, that that region is not. It's actually more concerned with... Um, well, recognizing, it and recognizing and interpreting um, buildings and buildings in outdoor settings rather than man-made objects. All right, I'll just pursue the argument. This is a nice experiment by um, uh, Geraint Rees, who's at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience in Queen Square. Quite similar uh, logic, but he exploited another form of ambiguity called uh, retinal rivalry. Um, most of the time when we have both eyes open, um, we're looking at the same, the same scene through both eyes and are unaware that we have two eyes because we just see one scene. Um, but if you, if you just uh, touch the side of one eye, you can move that eye a little bit compared with the other and you immediately see two images. You see double vision. Um, so the two eyes are actually analysing separately and under appropriate conditions, you can stimulate each eye with different images. And that's what's done in this, um, in this experiment. The, the person wears uh, glasses which um, are arranged so that one eye can see one pattern and the other eye sees a different pattern. And when you do that, interestingly, just like with the vase face illusion, you don't see both patterns together superimposed on top of each other, or very rarely. What, what you see is one or the other. Even though it's just different eyes that are being stimulating, and normally you're putting the two eyes together very efficiently. Nevertheless, when the patterns differ su sufficiently, um, the perception breaks down into this alternating pattern of interpretation again. So what uh, Garant did was, uh, first of all, to, to perform a control experiment to try to identify bits of the visual parts of the brain, several different visual regions, actually, around the back here, um, which responded slightly more reliably to vertical lines, actually red vertical lines, um, compared with um, blue horizontal lines. So he showed people, and this is in both eyes now, red vertical lines, blue horizontal lines, red vertical lines, blue horizontal lines, and just said to the computer, show me regions which um, are more reliably activated by the red vertical lines or more reliably activated by the blue horizontal lines. And that's his picture. This is an imaginary flattened out view of the human brain for one subject with these different areas shown. And then what he did was to ask the computer again, as Andrews had done, to look at all the red bits, all the bits that he knew responded more when the person was looking at vertical things, um, and compare them with the blue bits, while the person was looking at the two patterns through the two eyes separately. And therefore was seeing sometimes red vertical, sometimes blue horizontal, sometimes red vertical. Um, and he um, plotted out from their button pushes, they push buttons as well, 
when they were seeing one or the other, this is the solid line. So here the person's seeing blue horizontal lines. Here they're seeing red vertical lines and so on. The two eyes are alternating in their perceptual experience. The wiggly line behind it is the computer's prediction of what they're seeing based on the relative, relative blood flow within all of those areas that were slightly more sensitive to vertical or to, to, to horizontal. And it does a reasonable job of predicting, again, with about 85% reliability at any one moment, predicting what the person is actually seeing. So I think this, uh, this sort of approach is encouraging. Um, seeing um, very well correlated changes in, albeit gross activity in, in the brain, correlated with internally generated uh, changes in, in perceptual um, state. Here's um, yet another example, which um, um, again one might call um, mind reading, which is based again on alternations of perceptual interpretation, but in this case not even produced by anything in the outside world, produced by the person's imagination. It turns out that um, when you imagine something like a face or a patch of colour or something moving, um, there is an increase in blood flow um, and almost certainly an increase in nerve activity in the same regions of your visual areas of the brain that would be activated if you really looked at those things. So if you imagine movement, just close your eyes and imagine you're looking at something moving, a car driving by or something, then those famous uh, movement-sensitive areas here, in MT, the middle temporal area, would become more active. But your eyes are closed. You're not actually looking at movement. So interestingly, and this is, a very interesting, this is really very significant, I think, observation in the last 20, 30 years, imagination involves what's called top-down activation from within the brain of early areas that are responsible for the normal handling of the things that you are now imagining. In most cases, that's certainly um, the case. So what in this clever experiment by Nancy Kanwisher, she asked people to imagine either faces or buildings. She showed people some pictures of faces and buildings and said, OK, those are the examples. Now just close your eyes and um, imagine one or the other. And the people were able to flip backwards and forwards between imagining <coughs> faces or, or buildings. And here, the, um, the, the little areas that she's focusing on are the fusiform face area down there, the same one that, that uh, Andrew was, was looking at, um, and uh, a nearby area, anyway, in, in, in parahippocampal gyrus, which, which responds to, to buildings. Um, and she was, was able to see changes of activity um, um, in those two areas um, during the periods when the person was reporting that they were imagining either a face or a building. They were allowed at lib, at ad lib to flip between um, a building and a face and simply report what they were doing. And she was able to see the activity moving between those two areas um, in, in, in the brain. So this is an, inter I mean, this is a, it's an interesting um, tool for looking at gross changes of activity and asking whether they are correlated with changes in mental, mental state. I'll just give one or two more examples. This one of the most famous, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with it. Uh, I'll just describe brief, briefly work also done at, um, um, at Queen Square. Um, and it was focused on studying the function of a favorite area of the brain called the hippocampus. Now, a lot of um, lines of evidence suggested that this little region, which is tucked down underneath your temporal lobes, well, it's not, not little, it's actually quite large, but hidden from view, this, 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 this um, deep region, very evolutionarily, very ancient, um, is concerned with, with um, encoding, storing, and retrieving certain sorts of memories. Um, in, uh, in rodents, for instance, in, in rats and mice, uh, it's almost certainly involved in, in spatial memory, in, in the memory that the mouse has of where it's been, where things are, where food is, and so on. Um, and we know quite a lot about the very particular characteristics of nerve cells in the hippocampus of the, uh, of the mouse or the rat um, that suggest that those cells are capable rapidly of changing the strength of their connections in an interesting way. Uh, and, and that has become a kind of model of what memory 
might be, what the laying down of memory by, might be. It might consist in um, very rapid changes in the, in the particular strengths of connections between um, nerve cells so as to, to lay down in, in the network some form of distributed representation that corresponds to, um, to the thing that was seen or the place that was, was visited. In human beings, there was profoundly convincing evidence that this region is involved in, in what's called episodic memory, the personal memories of experience, what you had for, for breakfast this, this morning, who that person is who's just walked into the, um, the room that you met last week or whatever, these sorts of personal experiences, because when the hippocampus is selectively damaged, and it, and it can be by, by infections um, or by a deprivation of oxygen, during open heart surgery, it's not it's it's not ridiculously rare, unfortunately. Uh, um, after that surgery, the hippocampus is much more vulnerable than other par other parts of the brain to those sorts of things, and it is therefore um, the case that sometimes the hippocampus is selectively damaged, and in such people, um, there is a um, very disturbing, profound inability to form new memories, new personal memories. So such people have their memories from the past. They also have their other sorts of memory, how to ride a bicycle, how to speak their own language. They can remember their family and events in the distant past, but they just can't form any new ones. So it, you, you, I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of this, um, this condition. The poor patients who, have this, uh, who are in this state uh, treat the doctors and the researchers who are visiting them every day as if they were strangers every day. Same person who's been visiting you know, day after day, week after week, for years, walks into their room, says good morning, and they treat them as if they're a complete stranger. They don't know who they, who they are. I, I knew um, a, man, a very talented musician, um, who Clive Waring, who had this, um, this condition for, uh, resulting from a herpes simplex infection. Um, and he played a game with himself. Um, and there are some sort of philosophical paradoxes in what people do in this condition because they sort of know that there's something wrong. Well, how do they know if they're not capable of forming new memories? So how, how would they know that their present experience is, is odd? But he, he played a game with himself of holding a biscuit or a chocolate in his hand and looking at it and then closing his hand for 15 seconds or so and then reopening it. And to him, this was a magic trick. Because when he closed his hand, the chocolate disappeared because he was no longer aware there had ever been a chocolate. Um, when he opened his hand, there was a chocolate there that he didn't know about. So it was just as good as a magic trick. But if you, if you think about that, it's very odd because you know, he knew that he wanted to do this. So he must have known something about the whole cognitive um, context in which he was exploring his own particular memory uh, deficiencies. But, but certainly the, the loss is profound, and people with this condition are totally incapable of conducting anything like a normal life. Okay, so you would expect to be able to see, it's a long preamble for the experiment that was done at Queen's Square, you'd expect to be able to see strong activity in this particular part of the brain when people were laying down or retrieving um, uh, memories of that, of that sort, personal memories. Um, so they thought, the group that did this thought very hard about how they might identify um, a group of individuals who had a particularly rich repertoire of personal memories, and they chose London taxi drivers, because you know that taxi drivers have to go through this, this long training, typically two years of training, in which they drive around on a moped in London with their A to Z, learning all the streets, and then they have this pretty daunting examination in which they have to very quickly to give their best route to any particular street that's named um, um, to them. So they're you know, pouring huge amounts of spatial information into their brains. Um, what, the, um, what the experimenters had already shown was that if they asked um, normal people to um, remember a particular spatial task, and they used a kind of video game to do that, they indeed saw increased blood flow um, in the hippocampus on one side, on the right side. Left side is probably more concerned with language, with remembering words, individual words, remember what's said to you. 
So they then asked the bold question, well, if you do an awful lot of remembering, is your hippocampus changed in any way? And um, they produced this uh, amazing picture. This is um, not a functional MRI image. It's not a view of blood flow or activity. It's a, st it's a summary of statistical differences in the sizes of bits of the brain in taxi drivers compared with normal people. So what they're doing is using, function, uh, using structural MRI to plot out all the dimensions of different structures, including the hippocampus, in a whole bunch of normal people, then a whole bunch of taxi drivers, and just comparing them, saying, is there any difference between taxi drivers and normal people in any part of their brain? Um, and the interesting point is that there is. This is the posterior part of the right um, hippocampus um, in taxi drivers, and it was bigger than in normal people. The front part was slightly smaller, because the brain is limited in space and the skull it can't you know, expand in all directions. If something gets bigger, something must get smaller. And indeed, the right part was a bit smaller, but the back part was, was bigger. <coughs> Interestingly, these, you know, this is a classic result. Every taxi driver in London knows it. Um, um, what tends to get forgotten, every, you know, it's iconic. Hippocampus grows. I mean, it does literally get bigger if you do an awful lot of learning. Uh, what's often ignored is the fact that there are bits in other parts of the brain. This is the cerebellum back there, which are also different in size, which is, which is odd because the cerebellum is not supposed to be involved, certainly, in private ep episodic uh, memories. This is a, a symptom of these sorts of studies. The things that are easily explained get focused on, and those that aren't tend to get lost in the sort of mist of, of MRI. In fact, they're often kind of neatly filtered out by some kind of statistical uh, magic so that what's left is only the thing that you thought was going to be there in the first, in the first place. So here's a you know, really remarkable finding. The brain can change, even change its physical size um, in response to the way um, that, it's, that it's used. We have virtually no idea what that, that means, whether it means that uh, additional nerve cells are being born and added to that bit of the brain. That is just conceivable, because it turns out this is one of the few parts of the brain, one, one of the two parts of the brain, perhaps no, the one part in the human brain that can actually make new nerve cells. Um, but that's not by any means the only interpretation. Uh, let me show you another example of this, of um, the use of these sorts of techniques to look at the dynamic plastic properties of the brain. Um, and the question was asked by one of my um, graduate students a few years ago, Manu Goyle, what, what happens to all this visual processing stuff in the brain in someone who becomes blind and has been blind for a long period of time? Um, this is a monkey brain. The human brain is basically similar. All of, the, all of this stuff at the back going down into the temporal cortex, up into the parietal cortex, is all concerned with vision. So in a blind person, um, it's not being stimulated. It's, you know, there's no input from the... So is it just wasted? Does it wither away? Does it sit there consuming energy but doing um, nothing? Um, so he um, followed up some previous work that suggested that um, when blind people listen to things, or particularly when they touch surfaces, braille or other textured surfaces, there's, a, there's a, a, an increase in blood flow in the back of the brain in parts that should be visible. So uh, Manu, Manu um, wanted to kind of formalize that and ask, is there a relationship between what a blind person touches and the bits of the visual parts of the brain which somehow become involved in the task? But he, he um, preceded that question with, a, with um, another interesting one, which was to ask whether blind people, and these are all his subjects have been blind for 20 years, all of them had had some vision when they were young for a few years, but they'd all been blind for 20 years or more. He said, well, um, do, do blind people re re retain the ability to imagine vision? Well, certainly, if you speak to a blind person who had vision when they were young, then anecdotally, they will say that they do. And watching the body language of the facial expressions of a, of a blind person, when you ask them to imagine something, it's quite clear that something pretty he impressive is going on in their subjectivity. They're quite you know, startled by the, the images that they say they're conjuring up for themselves. So an obvious question is, does that relate in any way to things that we can see in, in the brain? Because, I mean, again, that would be interesting. His self-generated perceptual experience in a person who 
has not had real visual stimulation for years and years and years, is it related in some way to what we know of the organisation of the visual parts of the brain? And, and it is. What he did was to put blind people into, and sighted people and congenitally blind people who'd never had vision into the scanner and asked them to imagine a little scenario which they practised. To begin with, they were uh, asked to imagine that they were sitting in a room looking at a patterned set of curtains that were closed over a window, just stationary. Detailed patterns and textures all over them. They could make up whatever they wanted them to be uh, for 10 seconds. And they were signaled, the changes were signaled to them by a little tap on one toe. In these sorts of experiments, be very careful how you give instruction, what else you do to the person when they're in the scanner, because anything you do will cause activity in the brain. So you've always got to kind of subtract that out, and you want minimum interference from other things. So you can't yell at them, think of the curtains, because that'll produce masses of activity, language area of the brain, and so on. So a little tiny discreet tap on the toe to signal that they should switch from the, cur the static curtains to imagining that the curtains are opening and closing for 10 seconds. And then finally, final 10 seconds, the curtains open, and there's a face staring in the window at them. And they do that for 10 seconds. And they repeat that, those blocks of imagined static patterns, moving patterns, face. And you can now, by subtract, subtracting the brain signals in those three conditions, you can ask, is there any part of the brain that is active when the person's imagining movement specifically, imagining visual movement or imagining a face? And there is. So in both uh, sighted people and in people with late-onset blindness, you get enormous activity, actually more um, on average in the late-onset blind. In this region at the side of the head, that's MT, the famous motion sensor, the visual motion-sensitive motion area. And again here, activity in the lower down, the fusiform gyrus on the right side, fusiform face area when they're imagining faces. You see nothing um, specific in congenitally blind. They're not able to do the task. They don't know what you mean when you say, imagine that you're looking at some, something, not surprisingly. So that's interesting. The organisation of the brain is still sufficiently solidly organised that they can top down, whatever that means, from within their brain, turn on these areas and have the visual experiences that would normally be associated with their activity. So he then, Manu, then extended the experiment in this interesting way. Um, he wanted to know whether when blind people touch things, there might, might be activity in, in corresponding parts of the visual <coughs> cortex that would not normally be active in a sighted person. So he put people in the scanner, first of all sighted people, and, and identified MT, the, the motion sensitive area here, by showing them moving patterns and comparing them with static patterns the normal way. And identifying the fusiform face area, showing them faces and comparing them with non-faces. So there we are. We've got sort of localizations of where these regions are in normal sighted people. He then blindfolded those people and compared them with blind people, late onset blind people. And now no one's looking at anything. They're all blindfolded or blind. They're feeling things with their hands. And what they're feeling are dolls' heads placed into their hand, either a normal doll's head placed face down into the hand on a stick, static or moving around, or a sort of deformed doll's head, warmed up and deformed, so it has all the same surface characteristics but it doesn't feel like a face anymore. This feels instantly like a face to everybody. This doesn't, just this sort of amorphous lump thing. So now you see you can, you've got movement conditions, you've got kind of nothing conditions, you've got face conditions. You can do subtractions between them and say, is there any part of the brain that responds selectively to a moving thing on the skin compared with a static thing on the skin. And there isn't in sighted people. You can't, presumably there are, there are nerve cells that respond differently to movement on the skin compared to that, but you can't pick them up um, with the resolution of fMRI. But you get this whopping activity in blind people. And it's bang in the movement visual area. So movement on the skin somehow engages the movement sensitive area. And the doll's head, the face, compared with the non-face, selectively activates the, the fusiform visual face area, as if the touch system has borrowed the computing power of different parts of the, the, um, the visual system to help it with, with similar 
similar task. I mean, there are other interpretations of that, that result, but that's certainly one possibility, which is a kind of mind-blowing example, really, of the degree of, re of flexibility and reorganization that's, that's possible within, within our brains. I mean, the view is completely different now from, from um, even 30 or 40 years ago. So we now see, you know, every day there's another paper showing how your brain changes when you do this task or that task. This is a fairly recent one. And these are changes in the thickness of the gray matter of the cortex, this sort of cardinal indicator of whatever, of, of ability in terms of whatever. Cortical thickness changing after you've played Tetris, a sort of silly, simple computer video game um, for a while, for about a week. So all these detectable, just statistically significant changes of gray matter thickness all over the place, whatever they mean. So, um, you know, in terms of brain function, who knows what this is, um, this is for, whether it's um, entirely um, epiphenomenal or when it, any part of this, <coughs> as it were, represents significant changes that are necessary for the changes in behavior. These people get better, of course, at this task while they're doing it. Is this an indication of the getting betteredness of the, of the brain, or is it something in, entirely peripheral to that? Um, and perhaps the, the final example, and one which is very topical, because it's been in the news again quite recently, this is Adrian Owen, who does a very good job of staying in the news, reporting basically the same result year after year. Um, he, he was uh, at the MRC Brain and Cognition Unit in in, uh, in Cambridge, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not disparaging him. He's, he's, he's a very good researcher, and, and it is a wonderful observation, a great story worth telling again and again. Um, when he was in Cambridge, because it must be um, six or seven years ago now, when he made the initial observations, he was interested in um, whether people who appeared to be um, essentially unconscious but not brain dead, locked in. Um, utterly unresponsive to anything, unable to communicate even with an eye movement or a movement of a little finger or anything, just, just a, you know, a, a apparently totally um, um, out of touch with the world around them. He wanted to know whether that was, in fact, the case, and, and, and clearly there, there are big clinical decisions that could hang on that. So he wondered whether he might use brain scanning, to, as it were, to get into the mind of the person, and there's the immediate assumption that Looking at a brain scan is telling you directly about the mind of a person, telling you about their privy experiences. Uh, and nothing that he's, that he's done for sure demonstrates that, but my goodness, it's, it's pretty indicative and challenging. So the first thing he did was to um, ask uh, these people, well, just um, impose on these people either um, neutral sounds, meaningless sounds, or nonsense um, speech, meaning nothing, just you know, garbled sort of um, nothingness, or, uh, or real language. And what he found was that, um, um, that when he spoke to these people in sentences, saying anything, the um, parts of the brain were activated here, back in Wernicke's area and, and Broca's area and further forward in the frontal cortex, that implied that they were actually understanding the language. Uh, and this only happened in some of the patients, in others, in about three quarters of them. There was a little bit of activity, but it was purely in the auditory reception area of the cortex, as if they're hearing the sounds, but there's no difference in the response of their brain to sounds compared with language. So this does, is, in, is indicative that at least the network is still active that would normally be engaged when they're, uh, when they're listening to, to words. And this is, this is by comparison, by the way, with, with normal people who are not... Um, in this state. So very similar patterns of act activity. So he then went the next, um, the next step, and this is now the, you know, the surprising and uh, well-known result, of asking, asking them, lying there, completely unconscious apparently, to imagine that they were doing things, um, knowing that imagination can cause activation in, in, in the brain. So he gave them two imagination tasks, either imagining that you're walking around your own house, just, you know, you there, an unconscious person, imagine you're walking around your house and then scanning their brain. Or imagine that you're playing tennis, a rather cruel trick, really, on someone who's lying apparently completely comatose. But there we are, these are the two conditions which um, in normal control people, these are normal people, produce very distinctive and different sets of brain Activity. I won't go into detail about the areas, but they sort of make sense in terms of what we know of brain function. The, um, you know, the spooky thing is that in about 
a fifth or so of his patients. The patterns of brain activity produced by imagining tennis and imagining walking around your house were very similar in the patients and in the control um, subjects. Again, the inference being that they, you know, they, they, they knew they were following the instructions. And he went on, uh, asking whether this was just, again, some sort of epiphenomenal thing that had nothing to do with any kind of decision-making or knowledge inside the person, went on to ask them questions about themselves, just factual questions. You know, is your, is your father's name Smith or something like that, no, where he knew the answer and asked them, if the answer is yes, um, play tennis in your mind. Uh, if the answer is no, walk around your house. And, and the results were reliable. Um, and the, uh, the recent development that you will have heard about, I'm sure, just a few weeks ago was um, the extension with a lot of consultation of the ethicists before doing it, asking, starting to ask patients about their, 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 um, their emotional states, um, whether they're in pain, and presumably, eventually, at some point, someone will ask, you know, are you happy to continue living in this state? Would you rather die? That will be a real dilemma when that's done, and it will be done. Um, because if the person you know, plays tennis in their head to say that they want to die, um, I mean, ca how confident can we be of that uh, as a true indication of the wishes and the will of the person that we believe to be trapped in that, in that head? Is it fundamentally any different from believing what they say? Because after all, what they say is only kind of behavioral response, which is produced by their tongue, which is being activated by their, their brain. Is what they say a more direct re, uh, link to what they, they, they really, really want to themselves? Um, is it a more direct link than the imagining playing tennis, which might be their answer to the question when they can't do anything else? So we're seeing... Um, you know, headlines like this. This is in, in Canada. The work's now being, uh, Adrian's in Canada, so there are already test cases in Canada asking him, as it were, to do his magic for locked in people to, um, to find whether they're um, A, conscious, as it were, if, if this is an indication of consciousness, and what they want. Well, this is all, uh, you know, uh, this, I, I've tried to unpack with some qualifications the use of brain imaging to interpret the relationship between activity in the brain and states of mind. The real question is how far can that, that go? Um, and I want to, without any, and, 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 uh, without any suggestion that um, I'm making a personal judgment about where you draw the line, um, point to a couple of studies, again, very local, done at University College, um, which are testing, as it were, the boundaries of interpretation. Of, of these sorts of experiments. So this is the work of uh, Semi Ozeki, whom I know very well and I enormously admire his, his work, including this, I think it's very interesting, in which he's um, bold enough to say, you know, forget about dots moving on a screen or flashing lights or, or whatever, or moving fingers. What about something that really matters to people? Can we see anything in our brains that corresponds to something as, as deeply personal as being in love? Um, so he, in this famous experiment, showed people, um, University College undergraduates, I think, a um, series of photographs of, of other people, including occasional photographs of their girlfriend or boyfriend, and asked whether there was anything distinctive about the reaction of their brain to their girlfriend or boyfriend, and then interpreted that in terms of, as it were, areas of the brain devoted to love, love centres. The phrenologists would have, would have liked it. Um, I mean, to my mind, the only thing that makes this legitimate, and it, and it does because of, of what, it, what it is, I think that makes it legitimate is that the areas identified actually correlated rather well with what was known about path, pathways involved in hormone secretion um, for hormones that are known to be involved in, in things like pair bonding in other animals, in the extent of pair bonding in other animals. So it's sort of two, two roots of argument led to the conclusion that maybe some of these regions are particularly active when a, when a person says that they're in love. He did point out that um, there are also regions, by the way, that are very much less active when people see photographs of, of their loved ones, and they correspond almost entirely to regions of the brain that are concerned with high-level discrimination, with 
trust with judgment of reliability. And all of those, those are just suspended, apparently, which is as, as much a, an indication of love as the positive activity as deeper parts of the brain that seem to be involved in you know, squirting oxytocin out or something. Um, and, and, and finally, um, another example from Geraint Reese, and I described that beautiful experiment with the with uh, binocular rivalry, but um, perhaps this was going just a bit too far. It was, it was somewhat jokey because it was done um, in response to a challenge from Colin Firth um, when he was guest editor of the Today programme, and, and, and he happens to be interested in all this brain stuff, so he uh, managed to persuade uh, Geraint to do, to do this experiment. And the, or, the authors, are, apart from Kanai, who I presume is a, is a postdoc in the lab, and, and Geraint, who's the head of the Institute of Cognitive Neurosciences. The other two are Tom Fielden, who's the um, science editor of the Today programme, and Colin, Colin Firth, the actor. Um, and what they're interested in is whether there's any part of the brain which is different in, in conservative voters and Labour voters. Um, and they looked at the size of the brain. This isn't, this isn't activity. This is just relative size using this voxel-based morphometry technique. And indeed, there they are, identifying two um, areas which, which differ with self-rating of liberal to conservative tendencies along here, different categories, um, from a questionnaire. And lo and behold, there are tiny, tiny differences in grey matter volume, apparently consistently related, although the statisticians here will be pretty dubious about that, um, in, in these two regions. And they suggest, well, isn't that interesting then? Could it be, you know, could it be Gil Gilbert and Sullivan in, in reality? Um, you know, what is it? A little conservative or... Someone will know the, the phrase. Um, are we born to have particular political um, orientations and dispositions? Um, the, the problem with this, it's, not, it's sort of fun. The problem is you know, it does use resources. These, are, these things are expensive. And B, the potential, you have to think always what is the potential for the way in which these results will be interpreted and conceivably used by others. Um, the, um, you know, I would say that the work on communicating with people in locked-in um, syndrome is at the edges of what can be dealt with by, um, by society, that it demands for its employment and use much more widely than is justified by the type of um, evidence is already very strong. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, there's a company called No Lie MRI in California that is marketing um, MRI-based tests, lie detector tests. Um, they, this evidence has not been accepted in anywhere except India. It was involved, it was used in a case um, and led to the conviction of a woman for murder in, uh, in uh, India, even though um, the scientific advice that the court took all um, uh, advised them not, not to base their judgment on this, or certainly not on this alone. Um, and what it does is to identify areas of brain activity that seem to be more active when people are telling the truth and not telling the truth. It is no more reliable than a conventional um, lie detector, which means around 80%. It is subject to known methods for, for um, fooling um, the, uh, the, the test. Um, but, you know, there's a commercial market um, out there. And this, this sort of apparent application of the beautiful technology, you know, the marvellous machines, how can they get it wrong? Um, well, the machines can, un, can be no more reliable in any particular task than the design of the procedure and the analysis and the assumptions on which the tests are based. So finally, just before finishing with a counter example, um, a little cutting that I found on a blog just, just the other day showing how um, at least some people have still got tongue in cheek in, uh, in thinking about these, uh, these, these methods. I just want to finish by reminding you um, that the brain is not red and yellow blobs, that the brain is an awful lot, an enormous number of nerve cells. And the <coughs> title of my series is, is Neurons and Knowledge. Ultimately, if we are to give explanations of what we know of the world and how we plan our actions, how we behave, how we make choices, then it has to be in terms of, um, of uh, the nerve cells that our brains are made of and how their activity, their impulses, transmitting through networks, convey and represent states of mind, um, states of awareness, uh, decisions, consciousness, uh, um, intentions, plans, and, and actions. <laughs>
And I'll just show you an example of how an alternative approach, which is in some ways much, much more difficult than fMRI, um, could conceivably lead us closer, at least, to that goal of real explanations of brain function in terms of, uh, of personal experience, much more than blobs on an MRI scan. I just want to remind you, if we, you'll remember this, there, there's a, if you look at static patterns, you get activation in the back of the brain. If you look at moving patterns, you get this MT area strongly activated. So you might say that MT is, is the region of personal knowledge of movement of things in the world. When you imagine movement, that turns on. Um, I showed you last time that, at least I tried to if the movies had worked, that um, this area is capable, apparently, of making the distinction between movements that really happen out there in space and movements that are produced by you moving your eyes around. It can do that little calculation. Its activity seems to be correlated with what you really see. But remember that the area is not just a blob. It's packed with hundreds of thousands of neurons, those individual nerve cells connected by you know, thousands of connections, 10, 10 to the 5 connections on average each, 10 to the 15 connections in the whole brain. It's at that level that we really have to explain things. Now, it turns out that there is an approach that, that can be used. Uh, it's difficult from every perspective. It's very expensive. It's technically demanding. It's ethically um, complex. And that is to record activity from individual nerve cells in animals while they're awake, making judgments and decisions and telling you what those are. Um, and the only species really that, that, that makes sense for this sort of experiment is, is a species that's close to us because we want to know about ourselves and how we make decisions. That means monkeys. So this is research, um, and it's happening around the world, but on a small scale, largely because of the cost and the technical difficulties, which involves um, training monkeys to make complex decisions to report their judgments about what they're doing by pressing buttons or levers, and at the same time recording with microelectrodes inside, implanted into their, their heads, recording activity from lingual, single nerve cells. Uh, some people would simply draw the line and say, it wouldn't matter how valuable the results were, no, I'm not willing to accept that that's, that's justified. Well, um, that's difficult, and everyone, of course, is entitled to an opinion, and, and we have, in the end, to fall back on regulations and the law to express, as it were, a, um, a democratically arrived at decision about whether such research should be done. But certainly in terms of its potential to provide real descriptions of how the brain works, it is incomparably superior to red blobs on a, on a brain scan. So it turns out when you record from nerve cells in that area, in the um, MT area, in a monkey, while it's looking at moving patterns, each individual nerve cell responds when a pattern moves in a particular direction. Some cells respond one way, some another, and so on. They're all arranged beautifully. Every single nerve cell, pretty much, responds to movement in, in one direction. They're never interested in color. Na a neighboring area is interested in color. So um, can we make a comparison between the responses of those cells and what the monkey tells you that it's seeing by the buttons that it pushes? And this is um, work that's been done partly in Oxford by Andrew Parker and his colleagues, partly um, in the United States, particularly by Bill Newsom at Stanford, the, perhaps the leading researcher in this area. And if I'm going to be very lucky with my movies this week, yes, this is going to show, show you the kind of stimulus that um, has been used for quite a lot of this work. This is a pattern of dots. It's a, on a flat surface, yes? Um, Okay, that's telling me I'm going to have to stop in a minute anyway, right? Uh, what I would posit is that some of you are see, see, you're seeing this as a cylinder of dots, which is either moving, um, this is supposed to loop, but we, we all know that my movies don't work, but it's either moving that way, as it were, anti-clockwise views from above, or the other way, clockwise, right? Now, you can show that same picture to a monkey, and ask the monkey whether it's seeing it going clockwise or anticlockwise, and it'll press a button saying, oh, it's going clockwise, and then it'll press a button saying, oh, it's going anticlockwise. You can also record from the cells in, in, the, in MT, and what you find is that the cells will, the different cells respond to different directions of movement, and in this sort of situation, they have a tendency to respond to whatever dots appear to be in front. 
and they ignore the ones behind. So if the animal is seeing the pattern as moving in that direction, clockwise okay, viewed from above, then a nerve cell that responds preferentially to movements in that direction will respond. If they see it the other way, it will stop responding. Um, and this beautiful work done by Andrew Parker compared directly the responses of neurons and the response of the monkey while the neuron was being recorded simultaneously. Um, uh, as the, uh, the, the, the physical characteristics of the stimulus were varied under computer control so as to bias the judgment in one way or another. And the way that was done was that um, depth information, stereoscopic information was added, little bits and more and more and more, to pull one set of the dots forward or to move it back, hence biasing the judgment towards clockwise or counterclockwise movement. And what they produced was this extraordinary result. Two graphs. That's the whole monkey, the judgments of the monkey. This is the response of one nerve cell in its brain. Um, and what they're doing is varying the disparity, the, the depth information, pulling the dots forward or backwards, and hence biasing the judgment of the monkey towards thinking that it's going clockwise or going counterclockwise. That's what this percentage scale shows. The beautiful, beautiful, smooth functions. This, with exactly the same scale, it's just the same stimulus, shows the responses of a neuron that prefers clockwise rotation. And if you add depth information which biases the monkey towards a clockwise judgment, the cell's response increases reliably. If you, if you push in disparity information that um, biases in the other direction, the cell stops responding. With the same threshold, the same sensitivity as the whole monkey. Individual nerve cells behave like little monkeys inside the monkey's head. They're like little homunculuses, if you like, knowing as much as the monkey knows about the world around them. I'll just finish with a couple of examples of the kinds of, um, um, of ambiguous figures that well, we certainly can't yet explain, but will, that do deserve an explanation in neural terms. And it might be possible to use this kind of stimulus. If you watch that, it's ambiguous. It's a set of, it's computer generated, it's a set of dots. And I think what you'll be seeing is a figure turning around, yes? But if you keep watching, perhaps look at the pelvis here. It'll reverse and go in the other direction from time to time. Yes? Round one way, goes round the other way. Because it, it is literally graphically ambiguous. Now this very nice other example of the same thing. This is actually ambiguous. It, 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 in principle, physically, it's ambiguous. I would guess that most of you would be biased towards seeing this turning clockwise, seeing her going around that way. Yeah, that, that is the... the some, some not, some might be going the other way, but mostly... Um, and that's a postural um, thing which imposes a, a little bit of non-ambiguity on the image. Now, interestingly, if you put um, both of them together, and you now look at this figure and wait until it reverses to come counterclockwise, and then look at this one, it'll reverse this one too. Yes? No, you've got both of them going in different directions? I mean, that ha can happen, but it's, it's, it's less usual. Usually, you, the two things are locked together, which is terribly interesting, because whatever process it is that's going on, on in your head, the computational process, which is saying, OK, I'm interpreting all this ambiguity, I've decided for the moment that it's counterclockwise, that interpretation somehow propagates not just across your visual field, but to entirely different um, images. To understand these kind of computational processes, which make eminent sense in computational terms, how they're actually implemented in our, our heads, is a real but possibly plausible challenge. I mean, it's conceivable that we will have explanations of this kind of uh, phenomenon um, in, in neuronal terms. And finally, another little example. This again is an ambiguous figure. Uh, now, what are you seeing? Are you seeing it as, um, as a bar oscillating vertically? Or are you, are you seeing it as one that's oscillating on the horizontal axis? Let's see if I can change your judgment. So now, is it going around the vertical axis now? OK, so by putting that, um, by blocking off the bottom part at this moment, you can, you can remove some of the ambiguity because there's only one interpretation of that. If you now give the ambiguous information back, it holds and locks onto that interpretation. And you can then shift it again. And what you should now be seeing is movement around the horizontal axis. 
Okay? So, uh, I, at least some of you getting that? So your, your judgment can be biased by nibbling away at the ambiguity and then removing, the, restoring the ambiguity again, the, the interpretation that's been imposed by a reduction, by a change in the probabilities of the two interpretations, persists after the image is restored to its originally ambiguous state. So I just want to finish by saying um, uh, that I hope that I've given you some sense of the dynamism and the potential of brain research, that I've qualified some of the hype, as it were, around this, this subject um, because of technical lim limitations and difficulties in, of interpretation, not just some of the statistical qualifications about what images really mean and how big the blobs really are, but about the logic in interpreting apparent changes in brain states to um, differences in, in mental experience. Um, I've made a case for ultimate descriptions of brain function necessarily having to be in terms of, of nerve cells, of what neurons really do, because they are the currency of how the brain operates in the, in the end. The brain does not work by generating red blobs. It works by producing impulses in neurons and transmitting them to other neurons. So our descriptions in the end have to be in that form, even if some of them will only be models, because we won't be capable of uh, analysing everything at the neuronal level. For instance, we could never gain an understanding of language, or it's very, very unlikely that way because, you know, only people, only human beings do it. So we might have to rely purely on models derived by analogy with other similar computational pro, um, processes in our, own, in our own brains. So it's a mixed message, but one which is, I think, on balance, very positive and very exciting. But it's one that leads to um, the conclusion that um, the rigour of thinking from... Um, from the humanities, I mean, particularly from philosophy, becomes more and more important in constraining the interpretations that, that are put on results of, uh, of studies of how the brain works. And it's very easy to leap, leap to naive interpretations because of the elegance of the methodology. We need a little bit of philosophical constraint. And right on cue, my computer's run out of power, and, uh, and so have I. Thank you for bringing us to um, a wonderful conclusion to this series of lectures. I'd like to thank again uh, Dr. Shamil Chandaria for the opportunity to run these lectures and also for founding uh, the chair which Colin now holds in neuroscience and philosophy here at the Institute of Philosophy in the School of Advanced Study. I think uh, we've seen lots of evidence of the, the virtues that we hope are always exemplified by the people that we select to be the Chandaria laureate. And they're there in abundance with Colin because you have a sense of urgency and intensity of the ideas and of the inquiry. And as usual with the views that Colin holds, they're expressed uh, clearly, strongly, forcefully, and they're challenging. And I think when we uh, invited Colin to come and join us at the Institute of Philosophy, it was because we had a clear sense that we could make common cause with uh, someone so distinguished in neuroscience because, like him, we're interested in the business of understanding and explanation and that the real attempt to figure things out and get to the bottom of it and ultimately to understand some of the bigger mysteries about the relationships between the mind and the brain are not going to be done either solely on the side of neuroscience or solely on the side of philosophy, but progress, as Colin expressed, at the end of the lecture is to be hoped for by finding a language and finding the means to work together and to mutually inform the inquiries that have developed separately over such a long time and which are coming together more strongly now, I think, than at any other period in history. So it's with great pleasure that we thank Colin Blakemore as the Jandaria Laureate for 2012. And it's also been so far a tremendous pleasure to work with Colin. And I'm sure in his role of director for the study of the senses, we're going to see yet more of that uh, intensity of inquiry, challenging nature of explanation and understanding.
that philosophers so much admire and which we need the science to inform. So will you join me in thanking Colin Blakemore very much? Thank you.